we're very pleased to have uh, Mark Fletcher, who is the product manager for Avaya Public Safety Solutions on the call, and he's going to be uh, starting off this uh, webinar and going through some very um, good information regarding E911. Mark? Thanks very much, Michael. I really appreciate the opportunity to present today, and thanks, Kevin, as well. Sure, so let's you. just jump to the, to the next slide here. On today's webinar, we're going to be teaching you some things that you're going to need to understand about E911 so you can make the proper decisions for your business. We're going to look at the uh, aging E911 network and how it works. That's critical today to understand how that works. It's really going to help you make the right decisions. We're going to look at new network capabilities that emerging technologies called next generation 911 are going to bring and how that's going to affect your enterprise. We're going to talk a little bit about the law and E911 compliance and how you have to manage that and how that affects your business. When we talk about E911 compliance, managing the 911 liability is really about managing the location of your users. So we're going to show you how that can be done in an efficient and affordable way using emergency response locations or what we call EARLs. Many of the 911 features that you need are really already part of your Avaya core infrastructure. And we're going to show you through what they are, how they're used, and how to deploy them. And we're also going to cover some of the enhanced adjuncts by our DevConnect partners. Some of the common myths around E911. The first one is, my PBX can send location information to public safety. Well, the answer to that is obviously busted. The only information that can actually be sent by the PBX, or any E911 service for that matter, is a telephone number. This is really important to remember, because I think this is where people get confused. The phone number correlates back to a database entry where there are 20 characters or less that can actually be used to relate the specific location to the emergency call takers. That's all you really have. There's no information today that's coming out of your PBX. On the next slide, we see how a 911 call actually progresses through the network. A user makes a 911 call, and the PBX is responsible for sending that call to the PSTN. And of course, caller ID is attached to that, potentially a DID number or some number that's representative of, of the 911 zone that they're calling from. When that call reaches the 911 selective router, there are a couple of databases that come into play. The first is the MSAG database, which is Master Street Address Guide. That's just a database that says, this phone number is serviced by this address. And this address is serviced by this particular PSAP. And this particular PSAP is reachable on this particular trunk group. It's basically a routing decision. At that point, the 911 selective router sends the call down to the PSAP where they receive the voice, and they also receive the caller ID. Now, the specialized equipment at the PSAP takes the caller ID, and that's called ANI, or automatic number identification at this point, and it dips back into the carrier network, very similar to a call center when you have a refrigerator on order. You know, you call Sears or L.L. Bean or anybody, they know who's calling from your caller ID and telephone number. They dip into the databases. 911 does the same thing. Your phone number will retrieve a specific alley record, automatic location information, and then display that to the dispatcher. And that's really how 911 works. So you can see that if I send the wrong caller ID, I could end up the wrong PSAP. Or if I send, if I do end up the right PSAP, I send caller ID that's incorrect, I could produce a bad location record on the dispatcher's screen. This is why today, in the network today, the caller ID is extremely critical in your 911 process. And that's what really managing your 911 is all about. On the next slide, we look at the 
911 network today, and that was developed back in 1968, 1969, and it was really done in an effort to provide a single number for emergency services in the United States. Prior to 911's existence, you had to know the number for the police department, you had to know the number for the fire department, you had to know the number for the ambulance service, and you had to call those individual numbers or make multiple calls if you needed multiple services. 911 provided a single number to contact public safety in the event of an emergency. However, it's an analog technology. It's based on fixed endpoints that existed in a very hardwired environment. The network was simple, static, and predictable. A phone number meant a particular device at a particular location, and multiple devices didn't exist, and we didn't move them around. So having 911 based on a phone number was a great idea back then. However, things are a little bit different today. So when we send the 911 caller ID to public safety, what they'll see on their screen is a business name and a business address. Unfortunately, what public safety sees when they pull up to your building is the building. Where is the 911 caller? They have no visibility into that. And if you don't have a 911 solution deployed in your building, you also don't have any visibility to a 911 caller. In many cases, you're sending out the main billing telephone number of the building. And this is what's going to happen. On the next slide, we talk about sending DID-specific information. By sending a specific DID number, which would send particular, uh, perhaps a specific room-level identification, well, that may actually confuse emergency responders just as much as your main billing address. It doesn't sound logical, but think about it. You've all got a cube number, 3C239. If I call 911 and say, help, I'm at 3C239, even if I gave them the street address, 3C239 doesn't mean anything to them. They don't carry maps of your building. I cannot be specific, potentially, with 20 characters. So during the initial response, really what is important? The important part is getting the information of the address out to public safety. And by enabling what we call on-site notification, it allows you, as an enterprise, to simultaneously react immediately to that 911 call event. We can certainly provide internal first responders with the exact cube number, with floor plans, with all kinds of information that is going to make sense to people on your site. And in the three to six minutes or whatever it takes for public safety to reach your building, you're basically there at the door you need to go to, and you've got the red carpet rolled out between that entrance and where the emergency is. So this is where we look at all of the extra expense, all of the extra overhead of sending station level information to public safety and then keeping that information up to date because that's the difficult part. Keeping my information that's associated with my extension up to date in the public databases. That's where the expense comes in, that's where the overhead comes in. So if you do a zone based approach, even if that was down to the floor level of a building, but you had on-site notification that enabled you to react internally, you would actually have a more efficient response mechanism in place. I've talked to administrators at large peace apps. They've said to me, I'm sick and tired of getting a 911 call from this bank's administrative building, rushing over there only to find out that there was no 911 call there. It was a heart attack in one of their branch offices three towns over. People don't think about this as they flatten and consolidate their networks. These things become major, major issues um, that you really have to think about. 
So let's go to the next slide and look at our next myth. My PSAP has to have SIP for me to send SIP-enabled emergency calls. You probably heard next generation 911 is based on SIP. You're going to be able to send information. No, your PSAP does not need to be SIP-enabled. In fact, the 911 network in the state doesn't even need to be SIP-enabled. You can send a SIP 911 call out today, and it will be converted to a legacy 911 format and processed just like it is on your normal trunks. Why is this important to the enterprise? Because you need to start preparing for next generation 911. That's based on SIP connectivity. You're probably moving the SIP carrier trunking anyway as you look to reduce that. And the NINA I3 Next Gen 911 standard has built into its design gateway elements that support legacy PSAPs and legacy carrier network environments. It allows everybody to migrate to Next Gen 911 at their own pace when the transition is right for them. And the transition is built into the network design. Next generation 911 is defined by NINA. So let's talk a bit for a minute about next gen. What end users need to understand about next generation 911, and there's a lot of confusion in the industry right now. It's a model that's built on standards-based interfaces. It uses SIP to provide a multimodal session and provide location information, additional data, and all of that's transmitted to the PSAP over an IP network. Now, what exactly does all that mean? It means that there's an enormous change on how you get your information to the people that can help you. When next generation 911 comes into place, it's no longer about sending a phone number that's matching a database entry in the public database, and hopefully that database has correct and current information in there. It's about using the data embedded in your enterprise network, compiling relevant bits of information about the users, about the network, about everything, and then packaging that all up and sending it to public safety. In short, it says, I'm here, I need help, please come and get me but it means the elimination of the costly Annie Alley services. It means that you're sending data packets to the public safety network or a URI or URL. Here's a floor plan, plan map. Here's some information from an IP-enabled temperature sensor or my building environmentals. So it's a lot of additional information about the 911 event that public safety can now start utilizing uh, in their response. So let's look at the next myth around Next Gen 911. I need an expensive 911 management adjunct solution for my PBX. Absolutely busted and incorrect. Before you decide on any 911 solution, what you need to do is define your 911 requirements. You may not need or even want station level access. Think about the process with your risk management folks. Think about how you're going to respond to a 911 event in your building and how public safety is going to respond. And then work a plan that works for everybody. I keep going back to the PSAP administrator who said, listen, just get me to the building, and then when I get there, make sure you can tell me where the 911 caller is in that building. We can do that through on-site notification. So an effective 911 plan requires really three basic things. The first is location-based discovery and routing. This is the important part. We need to define manageable zones within a building 
and provide that location-based discovery and routing. When a user moves within the system, the internal databases need to be updated, and any information that's presented to the public safety entity needs to be adjusted. But we're not making updates to that public safety database. That takes time, typically incurs an expense. What we're doing is we're adjusting the information that we send to be relevant to the user's location. If I'm in this area, I send a caller ID that's relevant to this area that says I'm in building one first floor. If I move to another area and I'm in the boardroom, I send a different caller ID that already matches a pre-provisioned record in the public database that says I'm in the boardroom. Now, along with this zone level approach, on-site notification is the critical piece. That allows the internal staff to understand that an emergent event is taking place. Based on information within the network, internal first responders will know exactly where the problem is. And then coordination with public safety first responders becomes simple at that point. Now, with networks being flattened, consolidated, extended, we find remote connectivity of our users from their homes, remote branch offices where we may or may not have PSTN trunking, or any place really that broadband connectivity exists. Solving E911 location problem for that group of people is very specific and quite often is deployed alongside an internal discovery mechanism. And we'll talk about that in a little bit later. On the next side, we talk about on-site notification. That's a critical piece that the internal staff needs to understand that an emergent event is taking place. We can go to the next slide. This is where we alert public safety, or not public safety, but internal first responders that a particular device has dialed 911. We use the features that are available in the PBX to provide that location discovery and alert the appropriate people. Now, there's some very basic on-site notification available in the Avaya CM and the Avaya CS1000. There's a lot more information that you need to know and that we have on an individual, and this is where our DevConnect partners come into play. So this is the enhanced on-site notification solution by conveyance systems. The Century, Century Beacon Alert uh, can alert any agent that's logged on, and that's anywhere on the network. It produces a highly visible and audible alert, can provide automatic printing to the default printer on that workstation, as well as email and SMS alerts and integration with Facebook, Twitter, or mobile applications. But what's happening is it's taking all of the details from the PBX, details from the network, details from Active Directory or LDAP or whatever data source that you want to provide that, and then maintain a full historical record of that event for alerting and post-mortem evaluation of what happened even providing a map based on the location information that we have. Now this is important because all of this contextual data or graphical data is information that you will be able to send to public safety in the future with next generation 911. The Century solution by Conveyant was brought on as the Avaya Dev as an Avaya Dev Connect select product, and we'll talk a little bit more about select products uh, a little bit later in the presentation. So on the next slide, let's go to our next uh, myth question. Annie and Alley, or caller ID, will be continued to be used with next generation 911. Well, actually, that's sort of busted, although next generation 911 will be backwards compatible with Annie and Alley. 
The primary goal of Next Gen 911 is to move forward away from any alley, transmit real-time data and information directly to public safety. If, I've, if I'm in a bank and I'm being held up and I've got IP-enabled video cameras in the ceiling, the idea of Next Generation 911 is to provide that data to public safety so they can see what's happening at that location. Whether it's, as I said, uh, temperature sensors on a fire alarm, video feeds, or location maps. Even personal information if I choose to opt in. Hey, you know, I, I had an incident a couple of years ago. I'm on a ton of meds. I would opt in tomorrow if I could let Next Gen 911 know, you know, the meds that I'm on when I make a 911 call. Using this new form allows public safety to utilize multimedia information so call takers as well as first responders in the field can make a more targeted tactical response to whatever a particular emergency is. So on the next slide, let's look at how the enterprise data network is going to exist and how we're going to feed that information into the next gen 911 network which is known as an emergency services IP network or ESINET, ESINET. The NINA I3 Next Gen 911 standard is what allows for the conveyance of additional information. It's done over a SIP enabled trunk and it's data that we put into the SIP invite header. But pushing all the data that we have is not really efficient for the network certainly not efficient to public safety. So to assist in getting the data to where it needs to go, when it needs to get there, enterprises should look at the advanced capabilities of next generation 911 in their en environment. This is done by what we call deploying an ELM server or emergency location management server. This is basically your 911 application. It's just a functional name for the job that it's doing. It's providing location discovery. It's providing on-site notification. And it's also tracking information about users, devices, environmental data, and what we call event correlation. Gee, I've got three 911 calls from this section of the building. Oh my goodness, all the temperature sensors are reading 220 degrees. I think you can assume that there's some kind of fire. And that could be useful information to a lot of people. I call it feeding the next gen 911 beast. What it's going to do is it's going to empower public safety with additional information, not by transmitting it to them. Remember I said in, in the pit of flow packet, in the information that I'm sending to NextGen 911. I can send data or I can send a URL. The URL that you're going to send is going to terminate on that Elm server. It'll be a special link for public safety. That Elm server is in the DMZ behind your firewalls. It'll only allow public safety in, but that's where they can reach into your network and get the information that you have parked for them whether it be a floor plan or other data. And that's the beauty of delivering advanced information to next generation 911. That's what changes the role of the enterprise-based 911 solution to being something that's track, just tracking phones and trying to map a phone number with a location and then going out and making an update in a database and maybe 24, 48 hours from then that information will be relevant to providing a destination for public safety to come to to get information about a specific 911 call. Now, does NextGen exist today? No. Don't let me lead you down that path to think that it does. It's happening very quickly. There are pilot programs in different areas, but is, has the first NextGen 911 network been stood up and operational? No. But we are months away. We're literally on the verge of this new technology being deployed in many areas across the U U.S. You need to understand that as an enterprise because 
the 911 solutions that you purchase today need to have a definitive roadmap into this picture right here because this is where next generation will be within the next year. This is what you're going to need to be able to do very quickly. So if you're buying something that's strictly dealing with Annie and Allie today and the legacy environment, you're buying somebody's doorstop. You're buying somebody's fire sale. There's a lot of rhetoric that's going on about there about how things are done and there's a lot of confusion and people are being taken advantage of. Understanding how all of this works is your best bet as an enterprise customer. And then you can make sense yourself and very quickly you'll separate the wheat from the chaff. On the next slide <clears throat> you can see What's missing from the next-gen 911 picture? The Annie Alley databases aren't there anymore. They're replaced by this Elm server, providing floor plans, environmental data, video feeds, hazmat material safety data sheets. Whatever you want to send can be placed in this Elm server. So again, whatever solution that you look at has to be ready to take on this new role in the future. If we look at the th on the next slide, the third thing that's important with a E911 solution, support for remote teleworkers. I've been working from home for, gosh, I don't know, maybe seven years or more. I've been using technology that links my phone into the PBX going all the way back to when that was done over a dial-up modem connection and a digital line card emulator at my house and had a Nortel 2616 phone. Now with IP, broadband, remote teleworkers, that's the way to move. People are collapsing their environments into data centers. I work at home with an IP phone. My PBX, quote unquote, is in New Jersey or at least that's where one of the gateways of the PBX is. The PBX is actually out in Highlands Ranch. And if you look at the infrastructure a little deeper, the bulk of that is actually in a data center in Ohio. Obviously, that becomes a little cryptic when I need to dial 911 because 911 is very geographically specific. And any solution that you look at, or in addition to solutions, that you look at, you need to make sure that you have some category that supports remote teleworkers. Let's go to the next slide to our next myth question. I have to use the same E911 strategy and technology for all users on my system. That is absolutely not correct. The best thing that you can do is define different groups of users because they define different remediation efforts. Users should be classified by their E911 requirements. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with deploying multiple solutions and strategies side by side. Because rarely does this impact the total investment of your 911 solution if you manage that environment correctly. With here, we'll go to the next slide and talk about hosted E911 solutions. Because the physical network is very geographic, connectivity to the remote peace apps is often not feasible or even possible. And in these situations, the only way that a caller can actually be connected with 911 in their area is using a hosted 911 solution, which is also known as a VPC, or Voice over IP Positioning Center. So I want to turn it over to Mike Anderson with 911 ETC. 911 ETC is another DevConnect partner that has also been uh, put into the Avaya Select product program because of their solution capability. So Mike, if you could just give us a rundown on 911 ETC services. Sure, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, it, it, you look at this diagram. Um, first of all, if you see the uh, remote workers, uh, remote offices that are tied back to a core switch in a different geographic area or soft phone users, 
as Mark had mentioned, um, if the PBX is in a different location than those people, um, you would need to have some kind of local trunk nearest to where those soft phone users, home office workers, or remote office is. You'd also need to contract with the local telco for PS Alley. Um, another situation where this uh, would cover or we're finding more and more of a need for this type of solution is in the flat and consolidated extend where you put the, uh, the PBX in a data center and you're, you're basically uh, providing dial tone to your whole network enterprise throughout the United States from one core site. When that happens, um, obviously either you need to get a local trunk in every area where you have a physical phone, uh, contract with the telco carrier, or uh, you can use a thing called a VPC so solution, which we're finding more and more interest in because more and more of us are working from home and we're seeing a lot more flat and consolidated extend. But the way this works is that if someone dials 911, it will hit that call server, PBX, um, and then be routed to our voice positioning server, which is uh, in Atlanta and, and Denver, Colorado. But we take those calls via SIP, and we prefer SIP. Um, some of our customers aren't there yet in terms of being able to provide those calls to us via SIP, so we can provide a PSTN push. But there are some drawbacks to that that I don't want to get into today. But basically, the calls come to our voice positioning server via SIP. And based on the ANI, even though this is old technology, this is not next generation yet, this, will kind of, this is kind of like the halfway point to next generation in terms of how we're routing the call. But the call then comes to our voice positioning server, and based on the ANI that's presented at our voice positioning server, we know which selective router in the United States to route that call to. Um, and basically, a selective router uh, handles a geographic area. In most cases, it's a county, but uh, that's not a hard and fast rule. But that call then is selected, directed into the local selective router nearest to where that soft phone user, remote worker, or remote office is located. That selective router then routes that call into the PSAP, and they do a lookup, and whatever is associated with that ANI is where they're going to respond, such as that person's home, a Starbucks, if that soft phone user is sitting at a Starbucks or a hotel, um, if they're sitting in a hotel using their soft phone. Um, a lot of people say that, you know, this is, well, gosh, a soft phone user, why would they dial 911? But if that's something they're getting more and more comfortable with using, and that's the only phone in front of them, you know, you can be sure that they're going to dial 911 from that. We have customers where that has actually occurred, and they have to go find you know, where did that 911 call originate from if they have not implemented the solution. Another key thing that some of our customers came back to us after saying, hey, you know, we can cover these soft phone users, they said, well, that's great, but our users don't understand the importance of updating their location as they move that soft phone about. Uh, you know, they just don't get it, and they don't really care, to be honest with you, in most cases. But to eliminate that liability for the corporation, they said, you know, I want to be able to force my users to update their location on the fly. So we developed a product uh, called Softlo, which based on the NATed IP address, we continually pull it up at intervals of a, you know, a minute or two minutes or whatever. And we, if that NATed IP address changes, we know they've moved that soft phone. So we can give them a prompt to say, hey, please update your location. If that user chooses not to update their location and tries to tab through, uh, the enterprise has the ability to actually disable that soft phone until they put in a location or a valid address. Another neat thing is that we find people that travel to certain offices frequently or uh, do hoteling um, or you know maybe go from their beach. If some executives that we've worked with in the past where they go to their beach home and um, they can they can put in these configured addresses of places they travel to frequently and they just have to hit this is where I'm at today and it's a real-time update to this voice positioning server. Something that we were limited um, with old PS Alley technology, when we send the 911 update to the PS Alley database, they won't guarantee you that post until 24 hours later because there's a 24-hour cycle count. With this updating procedure to the voice positioning server, it's a, it's a near real-time update. I mean, it's a matter of seconds rather than days. So this is new technology that allows, especially the enterprise that are doing that flat and consolidated extend, the remote workers and soft phone users, it gives them the ability to actually cover them, and quite economically too. This is not something that costs tens of thousands of dollars. The next slide. Yeah, and one thing before we move off this slide, Mike, one thing that I um, want to mention, if we could just, yeah, just stay right there for a second. You kind of touched on this, but I want to make sure people understood this. This is kind of a transition point to next generation 911. 
So in this environment, you know, we're showing on the right side of the 911 ETC cloud connectivity into the selective router, which is over various types of connectivity that, where that can happen. That's irrelevant. If that local selective router, I mean, let's replace that with a localized next generation 911 network. You know, Raleigh, North Carolina, for example, they're in the process of turning up a localized next generation 911 network. Southern counties of Illinois, another area, um, another area down in Texas is, is firing up a next generation 911 network that's localized. When you have a teleworker that's in one of those areas, in addition to providing connectivity to legacy selective routers, the voice positioning server is going to be able to also provide connectivity to next generation networks as they start cropping up. So we don't have this, we're not going to have this umbrella overarching IP network for 911 in the US for probably a couple of years. You're going to see little pockets popping up and then at some point in time the national umbrella will start to unfurl. But in the meantime, the voice over IP positioning server provides you connectivity to next generation in areas that it's cropping up. And if correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, I mean you can start you could start pushing Pitaflow to those next gen providers out of your voice positioning server. That is correct. Yeah. So it kind of kind of lets you stick one foot in the pond. Right, so to speak. Exactly, and that's you know that's just where it's all going. Is I mean you know it's been coming for quite some time, and you know a few years back when we started providing this solution to customers, we knew next generation was coming. But at that time, you know there are no PSAPs enabled to be able to do this. But as you just mentioned, there are more and more that are testing it out and becoming next generation compliant, and this gives you kind of the the, the backbone to actually be able to deliver those calls into those next generation PSAPs when it becomes available. Absolutely. Next generation 911 was just um, promulgated by the. I love that word promulgated. By the way, um, it was just promulgated by Nina back on June 14th of last summer. I mean, that's when this standard came out, and the standard is really an end state framework. There's still a lot of activity that are working out the specific network details. So, I had Bill Hughes from TCS. He's a TCS is a large network provider in the next gen 911 or in the 911 space. And Bill said, I pushed him to say, when are we going to start to see the first publicly available NG911 network? And I think he told me back then, um, second quarter of this year. So, you know, that's coming up pretty quick. But I think we're really on track looking at what's happening in various places out there. So I think that's really important. Kevin, you can go to the next slide now. Thanks very much for, for stopping there. So Avaya considers 911 an incredibly important part of the enterprise strategy. Because of that, we've invited just a few of our established 911 partners from our ecosystem of DevConnect partners that to a brand new program called the DevConnect Select Product Program. Through the new SPP program, Avaya customers and business partners can now st order strategically selected, compliance tested, third party products and services directly with Avaya or their channel partner using a standard ordering process. Now, this program is reserved for 911 technology partners that we feel deliver unique functionality and extend the value of Avaya's products and both 911 ETC and conveyant uh, systems with their Century E911 location management product provide that level of functionality uh, and capability. So, 911 ETC is a one-stop shop for a fully managed provider of E911. When doing it yourself is not an option. They're a great system integrator. That's an excellent choice for obtaining the right resources without breaking the bank to, to get that solution in place. One of the solutions that, that they represent is the Conveyance Century E911 Location Management Server. And again, these are the first two and only uh, Avaya DevConnect select partner products for E911 that are on the market today. So a little bit of information about, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, this is Mike. Uh, I just wanted to add that, that these are not uh, mutually, 
with conveyance products, in certain cases, customers are just going to buy conveyance. They will not need our, our services. Um, and the same can apply reverse as well. So I want people to understand that in some cases, it's going to be a good fit where they just might need Sentry, um, and they can do it themselves. And, and, you know, we're very upfront about that. If a customer comes to us and says, you know, this is what we want to accomplish, we say, well, this is all you're going to need. Um, but if the VPC services or if they need some assistance and, you know, the various telcos that they decide to do PS Alley, that's where we come into play. But we also represent the conveyance Sentry product when they want a full uh, E911 solution, fully managed E911 solution. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. That's an important point because the last time I checked, when the Sentry, you know, shows up on your premises, there's no pull tab that you can yank on where that thing installs itself. <laughs> it's close. They're working on it, but it's not quite there yet. I mean, there, there's there's a lot of work that has to be done in the enterprise. Not a lot of work. There's work that has to be done. It has to be done logically, um, and quite frankly, there's a lot of people out there that are really just raking people over the coals on, on implementation services, just going so far and beyond what's, what's needed is unbelievable. ETC can provide those services for you as well as the services on the back end. And that's why I categorize them as a system integrator, right? And I have to, I have to commend you, Mike. I mean, I've seen them walk away from a customer lead that I've given them where it turned out all they needed was a Sentry product and the customer was more than capable of installing it themselves, they just said, here's what you should do, walked away, have a nice day. And, uh, you know, in today's, in today's market with the competitiveness that's out there, it says a lot about a company, at least to me. So, so on the next slide, with Avaya in public safety, um, we take great pride in participating nationally on several fronts. Um, I participate on the FCC's Emergency Access Advisory Committee. We're defining next generation 911 functionality and standards for people with disabilities. So they can text to 911, they can video to 911. Today, that group of people is really treated as a second class citizen when it comes to 911, and, and the FCC EAC is going, taking great strides in, in changing that. We also participate in the President's National Security Telecom Advisory Council. Kevin Kennedy, our CI, CEO, is on that committee. And I'm on the National Public Safety Broadband Network um, planning subcommittee that's extending Next Gen 911 services to first responders. So when I transmit all that great information, like the, the bank alarm video, you know, the bank's being held up, and the, uh, the teller presses the button, and the dispatcher gets the video. Oh, look, there's Mike Anderson in a ski mask and a shotgun again. You know, they can push that same information right out to the responding units and the SWAT teams that they can look at on their tablet devices before they go into a building or see what's going on. That's what that's all about. There's a lot of reasons to build this Next Gen 911 network, and it's got support at the federal level. Just on a conference call yesterday where it was being tossed around, why do we have statewide or state-by-state -state 911 legislation? We need federal legislation for 911. It's come up a couple of times, and it's really interesting when it does because that will be a big change for enterprises because now they'll have a single set to build to and hopefully uh, a more ubiquitous set of features and capabilities. Um, on the next slide, we also participate in several industry um, forums. NINA, the National Emergency Number Association, several of our uh, key workgroup committee members have the e NINA ENP certification. We also work with APCO, uh, as well as our folks over in Europe at ENA, the European Emergency Number Association, and the Next Gen 911 Institute. We've, had, we've helped draft several uh, documents that are prevalent in the industry, such as the MLTS PBX model legislation, the Next Generation ESI network design. Uh, the additional data work group is active right now where we're defining what the data you're going to be able to send from the enterprise to public safety is going to look like, how it's going to be formatted, and how it's going to get there. And we also worked on the Next Gen 911 transition plan that allows the PSAP to get from legacy to Next Gen in an affordable manner that doesn't, uh, doesn't break the bank. And we also play over in the European Emergency Number Association with eCall, which is their version of OnStar as well as um, guides for multilingual calls 
or we have to bring in multiple call takers. Avaya is very, very popular uh, in public or in social media. So on the next slide, we've got a couple of links that you're welcome to reference. Um, the first is our public safety landing page at avaya.com public safety, as well as our Avaya connected blogs that are dedicated to 911 in the enterprise, the carrier network, and the PSAPs, and that's at avaya.com forward slash Fletcher. There you'll also find links to my weekly podcasts where you can subscribe and get all the, uh, all the good juicy dirt. Um, so with that, I want to thank everybody for uh, attending today. It was an absolute pleasure to speak to you about this important topic. Mike, I appreciate you being here with this and facilitating this. This is important information. Um, as we move and change our networks, you know, a good, solid VPC provider is going to be required to deal with many situations like the work at home user. And I'm one of them, so I'm very interested in what happens in that space. And, uh, and I'd like to officially welcome you to the Avaya Select Product Program um, you know, with your products and as well as Conveyant with the Century Location Management products um, to where customers can now buy with confidence. So thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate you joining us and uh, giving us all this great information.